but it is really good to be here. And you know, in 2012, as we reflect back just a year, it's been quite an incredible time across this country in state after state. And it was wonderful in Ohio to have this wonderful burst of energy and good news. Because, you know, if we could just get some energy out of Ohio, it'd be a lot better. <laughs> but you know, so much of the news and our current reality is so depressing and really tough and difficult to face. But I'm not going to talk about the current reality tonight. During the course of this conference, both Vice President Lilly Eskelson and Secretary Treasurer Becky Pringle will be here. And Becky will talk about kind of the perfect storm that got us to where we are. She will talk about the heavy toll it has been taken, has been taken for all of us. But more importantly, she's going to urge you to stand up and seize the moment. And Lily is also going to refer to the current reality. And she's going to talk about how around the world and this country, people are standing up and speaking out. And she's going to urge you to act and to fight a fight that we cannot afford to lose. But for me tonight, I don't want to talk about current reality. And I don't want to talk about the great defense that we're playing against all of the attacks all over this country. I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about where we need to go and the strategies that we need in order to get there. Last summer at the RA, I uh, had read some things and I used the word crossroads in my speech talking about that we were at a real crossroads. And it's been interesting to me that seems to be the word of the times. I've read in so many places about crossroads. Now some of them are quite funny, others are a little more serious. Woody Allen, you know which category he'll be in. <laughs> Woody Allen said this, more than any other time in history, mankind faces a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other, to total extinction. <laughs> Let us pray we have the wisdom to choose correctly. <laughs> On a more serious side, a writer for the Seattle Times, John Talton, I caught one of his articles and the, the headline just grabbed me. It said, our American promise is at a crossroads. And he talked about what the American promise is. That if you work hard, you're willing to adapt, that you have a real shot at moving up, at grabbing your dream, whatever it may be. And he mentioned that in America right now, only 37% of the people believe that our best days are ahead. And 55% believe we are, we are very or somewhat likely that our children will not have a better life than their parents. Pretty pessimistic. And in his article, he laments about the change that has occurred in those years since the Depression and World War II. Because from 47 to 79, it was a very positive time in our history. Productivity in America went up 119%. And while that productivity went up 119%, hourly wages went up 100%. They doubled. And if you looked at the lower one-fifth of wage earners, their wages went up 122%. And the highest one-fifth went up 99%. In other words, it was a time where everyone was succeeding. The tide raises all boats. And when you think in that period from 47 to 79, we have the GI Bill. And we have the Civil Rights Movement. And we have the National Defense Education Act. What a time those 32 years were and what we achieved as a nation. But then he went from 1980 to 2009, 29 years, almost the identical time period. Now productivity didn't do quite as well, but it still went up 80%. Hourly wages went up 8%. The bottom one-fifth, their wages went up 18%. And the top one-fifth, if you take out the 1% and leave the rest, theirs went up 65%. But the top 1%, 
their wages went up 275%. So he was lamenting the change. And see, it's a crossroads. It's a choice. Where do you want to go as a nation? Now, not far from here is the FDR Memorial, one of my favorite in DC. It's unique and different, it's huge. It has three separate areas, one for each of his terms. You know how they always say this isn't carved in stone? This is. What I'm going to tell you is carved in stone. But it was a quote that the first time I was there, I, I didn't want to forget it. I had no pencil or paper, so I snapped a picture of it to make sure I had it. But FDR was talking about America. And he said, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. See, it was a philosophy of a nation. That yes, there will be people who get extreme wealth. But as a nation, our responsibility is for all of its people. How clearly he defined what I believe are the choices for today. On the one side, we have the 99% versus the 1%. The privatization, follow the money, that if someone is making a profit, it must be good. And their strategy is very simple and clear. They punish anyone who disagrees with them. They simply attack those. They want to eliminate unions. We're in their way. So they go after payroll deduction, an agency fee, anything and everything in order to move that union out of the way. Because once unions are no longer there, the path to their future is clear. No obstacles. They went after voting rights this year, suppression of voting rights. Some 30 states introduced legislation that they said was to get rid of voter fraud. No one can give an example of where it happened. And it is, isn't it ironic that the three groups that they are really going after in these bills, elderly, young students, and African Americans, could it possibly be because all of those groups voted 70% or more for the current president? That wouldn't be true. Surely, that wouldn't be true. You see, they don't, their vision doesn't include a democracy. I finally found the word that describes it perfectly. Oligarchy. Webster says that is when a small group of people control the government for selfish or corrupt reasons. It is a selfish vision. It is for a small group. You know, one of the things that drives me crazy is they keep calling them the job creators. You know the 400 wealthiest people in America have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 150 million. Now think about this. If those wealthiest 400 people all bought three cars, that's 12. If one in four of the bottom 150,000 buy a car, that's 40 million. Now which of those do you think creates more jobs? Buy 12 cars or 40 million cars? But see, that other vision, that other choice, is the one that we all grew up believing. It's what our parents taught us. It's what our own teachers and community taught us. It's about America that has promise. It's about the dream. That if you have it and you work hard, you can achieve it. It's about expanding rights. It's always trying to make the words come true that all people are created equal. We didn't start out that way, but we've spent a long time trying to get to that point where we actually reflect the ideals. That's the one we're in. It's the one each of you live every single day. We know about the role of public education in that vision, the great equalizer, the vehicle to get wherever it is you want to go. And for NEA itself, our core values just scream to that vision. Equal opportunity, a just society, democracy, professionalism. See, that is who we are. Now, I'm not going to have a show of hands to say which vision is yours. I already know where you are. In the case one of those top 1% slipped in the room, I won't embarrass them. 
by having them raise their hand. But you know, I know where our values are. But it's not enough to say it. It's not enough to want it. It's not even enough to have good intentions. Because we as an organization, we as individuals, will not be judged by our words. We will be judged by our actions and our behaviors. We have to take responsibility. We have to fight for our vision of a great public school for every student. And we must live our mission. We must do that every single day in what we do. And frankly, creating an offense gives me energy. I can tell you there are two places I get more energy and passion than anything. When I think about that office, the first thing I think of is the why of public education. You think back, why did you decide to work in public education? And I don't care what your job is as an adult, it's different in education. You know, if you clean buildings at night in an office building and no one's there, that's a whole lot different than cleaning an elementary school. <laughs> My wife is a legal assistant. You know, in all the years she's worked in a law firm, they never ran out of paper? Not once? <laughs> it's just a different world. So the why of public education, our belief in that it's the foundation of America and what it does for every child, and my guess is for every single one of us in this room. Because I know I'm standing here not because of the wealth or social prestige of my parents. I'm here because there was a system that said if you believe and you have a dream, there ought to be a way to reach it. And I got to live my dream. I didn't just have a dream, I lived it for 23 years. I decided in seventh grade and I got to do that. See, so that why of public education, it's not something we just have to say. It's deep down inside, we feel it every single day. It's why you go into those schools where you don't have anywhere near what you need, but you find a way. It's why in Chester Upland, Pennsylvania, the school district says, you know, I'm really sorry, we ran out of money, we can't meet payroll. And the education support professionals, the teachers took two motions at a meeting and said, we will continue to come even if you don't pay us for as long as we can because those kids don't have option B. They need to be in school and we're gonna be there. That's the kind of vision of America that we believe in. But there's another place that I get all kinds of energy and passion. It's because I'm just tired of them showing absolutely no respect for the professions and the work that adults do in schools across this money this country. I mean, Newt Ginrich said we ought to get rid of all the custodians, let kids do that. Number one, he insulted these kids who come from poor families. And number two, he really doesn't understand what our custodians do about keeping the building healthy and clean for kids. He doesn't have a clue. And I'm tired of these people who think anyone can be a teacher, just give them a script and you too can be a teacher. I am just tired of it. I'm actually kind of just sick and tired of being sick and tired. See, for me, it's time to take charge of our future, define our own future instead of allowing someone else to define it for us. We can do this. It's our job. We recently celebrated the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I was thinking of how the labor movement and the civil rights movement have always been hand in hand. That you can't have one without the other. They depend on each other and they are both absolutely essential for creating a middle class, for giving dignity to all people. And we will do this together as we move forward. Because you see, we face the possibility of a new society, one with less opportunity, fewer rights, and a greater division than ever before. We face a society with the possibility of having the haves, the have-nots, and the never will have. And that is not in our vision of the future. You see, this is not just a democratic struggle. It really is a moral struggle. It's about who you want your country to be. What are the core values of America? It's not profit, it's not money, it's people. It's about just society, that's who we are. 
And if we want to lead in this effort, we must advocate for more than our members. We cannot only do that. We have to advocate for our students. We have to advocate for our profession. And we have to advocate for social justice in America. As you look around this country, we already know what happens if we're not united. Our voices will be silenced. And without collective action, we can't stop the creep of injustice. And we can't stop the diminishment of public education. NEA, we cannot settle for less. We cannot settle knowing that our students need and deserve so much more. And we cannot settle for an America without promise and dreams. We in the NEA have to live our vision. We have to behave every day for that vision. I want to talk to you a minute about what that may look like. What does it mean to lead our profession? And I, it's both. It's plural. Professions. Because our education support professionals must do the same thing as those of us in the classroom. It's about quality. It's about bringing a value train to what we do that no one else can touch. That's what we have to do. Now, in the profession of teaching, what it means to me, just imagine one whole component about defining who comes into the profession. Right now, in this country, we lose 47% of all teachers in the first five years. And then we listen to these people, and they say their biggest problem is it's too hard to fire the ones who are left. My answer to them is, if that's the situation, I'm telling you your recruitment, training, and hiring system is totally broken. It doesn't work. You're hiring the wrong people. What we ought to do is make sure that everyone who comes in the classroom is well-trained, certified, and licensed. How dare you allow someone in with a class of 30, or this year 45, students who is not licensed? That's not the way it ought to be. We ought to make sure that every teacher is qualified. And you know how you get that? I love it when they talk about recruiting from the top 25%. Oh, I want them to. Because you can't do that if you don't have a compensation system that lifts it all up. You need a compensation system that everybody gets paid well. I want to raise that bar. I want to make sure that before you walk in there as a teacher of record, that you've been fully trained. But then there's another whole component that excites me, and that is owning our own professional practice. Owning our own professional practice. From day one to the last day, whether it's the evaluation or professional development, we ought to define that. Why in the world do we allow someone on the outside to tell us what we need to know and be able to do? That doesn't make sense to me. And when it comes to evaluation, we know these systems are broken. I used to say to my principal, you're never in my room. He said, well, I don't have to come in your room. You're a good teacher. I said, how in the hell would you know? <laughs> you haven't been there in three years. Why don't we do our own? If they won't work with us, then do it without them. Don't ask for permission. Proceed until apprehended. Just do it. You know, one of the things that's strange about our organization is we're really kind of funny about peer assistance and review. Like, Oh, there must be something diabolical here. Here's what I've noticed. I know of no place in the country where it's been imposed. No one has made teachers do that. And the only place it exists is where it's union-led and it's successful, like in Columbus. Now, now that, let me ask you something. Does that really surprise you? It's union-led. The professionals decide what it looks like they implement it, they design it, and they implement it. Duh. <laughs> We're the professionals. We know. So we shouldn't shy away from that. We ought to take it on. We know better than someone on the outside. We know better than someone on the outside. Now, then a third area that I just excites me, and that is about students. I said we have to advocate for more than our members. We have to advocate about students. See, that's why priority schools are so exciting to me. If you want an example of professionals stepping up, these priorities, their school, priority schools are saying, we know that in these schools, students are not succeeding. 
And we're not going to listen to a legislature or a governor or a federal department of education tell us what to do. We will decide what's necessary. You see, it's like when you go to a doctor and you don't feel well. He or she must first diagnose what's wrong, and secondly, they prescribe something to make you better. I have that kind of confidence in our organization, in our members, that as professionals, they know what to do. We need to own that. We need to be the ones who say, if something's wrong, we're going to fix that. And we cannot allow nor tolerate that the status quo continues. The idea that in this country we have a million dropouts a year, in 10 years that's 10 million kids without a high school diploma. What possibility is there for them for the promise of America? To own a home, to be able to raise their family, to educate their own children. We cannot allow that to go on and the dropout rate does not fluctuate like the Dow Jones, it's constant. About 25% every single year, unless you're poor, African American or Hispanic, then it's about 50%. How dare we in the richest, most powerful nation in the world tolerate those results? And we are the ones who ought to define what needs to change. You know, the sad thing is, you know, we don't like Teach for America's idea of a five-week training course. We don't like the idea of trying to build a profession with two years. You know what bugs me the most? We allowed that market to exist. They're not in any of the wealth, wealthy suburbans, are they? We allowed those schools to exist that created a market. And you know what's worse? All of those people who are for vouchers and charters, what do they use as their leverage? What is their justification for vouchers and charters? Because we have schools that don't work for kids. You want to shut all those down? Close down their markets. Make that school viable, living and working for students. They have no place to go. We have the choice and the opportunity to close that down. But my last component is the one that undergirds it all. It's union leadership. I don't believe this can be done without it. And I need you to think about yourself the way I see you. I need you to respect and celebrate your professional skills. No matter what your job is in that school, every single adult, you've got to feel it. When you, you've got to feel the power that we have collectively in this organization to do whatever it is we want. I want you to swagger. You remember John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever when he had to strut? That's the way you ought to feel inside any time you're walking down the hall. I am an educator. I am a member of NEA. I mean, you've got to feel that inside and don't let anybody ever take that away from you. Because when they take that away from you, you lose your soul. It is what brought you here. It is what keeps you here year after year. Okay, i got to shut up, so I'm say 30. Uh, <clears throat> you know, in the political world, they have this cool thing. They get a group of people in an audience listening to a speaker, and they give them a dial. And all the time they're speaking, they can dial it up or down. I like what he's saying. I don't like what he's saying. Eh, kind of in the middle. I need one of those. <laughs> See, I need to know what resonates with you. I need to know how you feel when we talk about the why of public education. I need to know how you feel deep down inside when we talk about the kids who are being left behind, who are being shortchanged, who are being robbed of their future. What do you feel? What's your gut reaction? I need to know whether you, as an educator, as a good and moral person, whether you struggle with the idea that we're part, we're part of this system that openly discriminates against kids who are poor or students of color. I want to know whether you struggle with wondering what we are leaving for our children and grandchildren. Is this the educational system that we want to pass 
forward. Because, see, that makes the difference. My theory of change is very simple. If you're comfortable with the way things are, why would you want it to change? Just leave it as it is. But when you are uncomfortable, when you are dissatisfied with the way it is, not only will you accept change, you demand change. When you leave this conference, I want you to leave here gloriously dissatisfied. <laughs> I want you to be so upset, rumbling and down deep inside that you just got to bust out and change the way this world is. It's up to us. Now, I've talked about a lot of things tonight. Some of them are positive, some aren't. But I need you to know one thing before I leave. It may sound crazy with the kind of things that swirl around us every day, but I am optimistic. I've never been more optimistic. Because, you see, I know the power and the potential of this organization. I've been around a long time. I know the power of this organization. I'll tell you a quick story a minister in a small church that had a building fund for a long time. And one Sunday he said to it, looked out at his congregation, he said, I have good news. We have enough money to meet the goal of our building fund. And you could just see the smiles in the audience, polite, polite applause. He said, the only problem is the money is still in your pocket. <laughs> now, see, I know the power of this organization. The problem is it's still in your pocket. And I need you to live it, to believe it, to lead with that power. That's what I need. Here's something else I know. I know we are the ones to do this. I mean, I want you to think a minute. If NEA disappeared tomorrow, who do you think could do this? Maybe five governors would get together with a great idea. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe an enlightened state legislature. Maybe Congress. I mean, where would you go? Name another organization that is in all 50 states plus around the world on military bases. Name, name another organization that is in literally almost every single school district in America that has structure, resources, people, leaders, communication systems, organized buildings and locals and state affiliates and a national. So if it isn't us, I don't know who it could be. And I know right now is the right time. Because if it isn't right now, when would it be? Maybe after the 2012 election. Or maybe we ought to wait till the, the economy just kind of gets up and going a little better. Or maybe we ought to wait till we all retire and we'll let the young people take it over. No, no, no. Today. Today is the day. You know what do they say? The best time to plant a shade tree? 20 years ago. The second best time? Today. Right now. There's one other thing I know. I know that no matter how much negative out there, I am not going to allow these people of doom to rob me of my belief in this organization, in our vision of a great public school for every student, or my vision of America. I'm not letting them take it. And I know that this is not the time to give in, give out, or give up. This is our time. We are going to do it together. NEA will succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.